All right. Stop good. over. There we go. Stop overthinking trophy deer management. Streamline approach to growing bigger deer in the mid Atlantic. Um, so when Thomas or when Luke approached me about doing this presentation, um, I was really excited. He, he he told me about all the different, you know, walks of life, all the different participants joining in on these um, people from backyard pollinator habitat, uh, deer hunters, agriculture producers, um, people from all different walks of life. Life are always just in, infatuated with wildlife, and it's why how I got my start. You know, as a little kid, I was always outside playing the dirt, getting getting dirty, and, and getting exposed to these great experiences we have an opportunity to have in this country. So, um, this is like I said, stop overthinking trophy deer management. A lot of times, people just get so caught up in the newest fad or the newest gimmick in 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 the world of deer hunting and deer management that they lose sight of the things that that have got us to where we're at today as far as uh growing trophy deer and be, being able to have successful hunts on your property all right so before we start i figured i'd put some big deer picture in here to get everybody's attention um, this was a deer harvested uh, near my farm in uh, Cumberland County, Kentucky. Uh, this deer was harvested on my neighbor's property. You can see in front of him the, the antlers that, that we found two years prior. So he was two and a half year old in the foreground, that, that set of antlers. He was three and a half years old, that next set of antlers behind it. And when he was harvested, he was four and a half years old. So you, you can tell just by looking at it how important age is going to be in my presentation as far as getting these deer to where they need to be to reach their full potential. Um, age is crucial. There's no shortcut for time. You know, it, it's going to be an ongoing theme throughout my presentation. Being able to identify deer on the hoof, how old they are, um, it, it's worth its weight in gold from the deer stand. If you're trying to, to manage your herd for for both um, body size, antler size, just overall herd health, um, giving them the proper age structure is gonna be super important for any landowner. Here's the deer I got last year off that same farm. Here's the deer my dad got the year prior off that same farm. And these are all in South Central Kentucky. So South Central Kentucky is not known for big deer. <laughs> um, this farm was uh, very much, I'd call it neglected when we took over six years ago. Um, and now we're producing some fantastic animals on a regular basis. Um, it just goes to show, you know, it's, it's, it's hard work, but that hard work is enjoyable and that, and that work pays off. A little bit about me. I'm a wildlife biologist. I went to West Virginia University. Um, shout out Morgantown. I, uh, I'm looking forward to football season kicking off. It's going to be a hard one for my mountaineers. I'm a passionate conservationist. Like I said earlier, I was growing up, I was just, you know, enamored with being outside. We lived in, I grew up in Phoenix, Arizona. I was always playing around in the, the South Mountain behind the house. There's um, some BLM million back there. I was always playing around on and got caught up on it from a young age. Um, proud dog dad of being Jovi. I just locked him in my bedroom because he wanted to participate in this, but um, I didn't want him distracting me in the background. I'm an outdoor writer, as um, Luke said. I write for Quality Whitetails, uh, contributor for Jury Outdoors, um, Game and Fish Magazine um, are kind of my, my bread and butter when it comes to talking habitat. So hunting stories, conservation, um, habitat techniques, herd management, that's kind of my wheelhouse when it comes to writing. I'm the owner of Whetstone Habitat. I'm a hunting junkie. I'm getting ready to head off to Montana for my first elk hunt. Um, I'm going to be <laughs> busy this fall. Um, I'm an invasive plant's worst nightmare. You guys might get sick of hearing me talking about invasive plants and why you should care about them. I'm a closet bird watcher is one of those things where, you know, I was always uh, making fun of the bird people when I was in college and I begrudgingly signed up for ornithology and uh, I love it. It's something else to do in the deer blind while I'm, while I'm sitting around waiting on something to happen. Wilson County Transplant. I live outside of Nashville, Tennessee. I grew up in Harrisburg, Pennsylvania. You might be asking yourself, what does a guy from Tennessee know about the mid-Atlantic? I grew up in outside of Harrisburg, um, 717 through and through. Um, very familiar with the area. I grew up, cut my teeth out there. And um, let's face it, we're, we're managing for deer and the whitetail's got a huge range. And while, you know, some of the problem species you might be, you might be dealing with in, let's say Virginia or Maryland might be a little different than what I'm dealing with here in Tennessee. The overall, you know, management is going to be the same, you know, minimize invasives, 
talking about what time of year you need to focus on for providing food, cover. We're managing for the same animal, just the, the components that make up that animal's niche is gonna be slightly different depending on where you're at in the country. Here's an example of one of my management plans. This is just part of the, part of the property. This is a management plan I wrote for a client down in Southern Tennessee. Um, just wanted to give an example. I know it looks like a Candyland board. It looks like a lot of fun. It is a lot of fun to play around out there. Um, it's a beautiful property. And I just, I just wanted to take a moment to point out if you're looking at any of those green polygons out there. So we're in, we're in Southern Tennessee. It's very hilly country, as you can tell from the taupe lines. Um, flat ground, tillable ground is at a premium, you know, and all of those green polygons in this, I'm not telling them to plant food plots, you know, all the green here, this is all native habitat, this is all pollinator plantings, native grasslands, you know, old field management, so just something I want to take note of, it's, it's not all about food plots, you know, a lot of timber stand management, we got a, a lot of cool projects going on out here, oak savanna up in the northeast corner, we got Plenty of invasive species treatment taking place on this site, but just wanted to give you an idea when I'm talking about these management plans, kind of how they lay out and um, why I'm doing all this. I'm trying to get these, these landowners to, to contribute to the overall system going on on their property. There's so many moving parts when it comes to wildlife management and conservation. And while a landowner may hire me to come in for the opportunity to, to harvest more deer or bigger deer, um, it's all of the other benefits. You know, people always talk about deer being an edge species. And what does that mean? It means deer gravitate towards areas where two different habitat types come together forming an edge. Okay, pretty straightforward, really pretty um, elementary version of how deer behave on the landscape. So when you're talking about an edge species, what better way to provide for them than by providing as many different edges as you can into a habitat? or into a landscape. So that's different habitat types. When I'm managing a property for deer, we're managing for old forest, or old growth, we're managing for young forest, we're managing for old field habitat, we're managing early successional stuff. You know, there's so many different parts, as many different habitat types as I can squeeze into that property, you know, in a, in a manner that makes sense for the hunter, the better off those whitetail are gonna do. They're gonna thrive in an area where you can get a bunch of different habitats kind of all butting up against each other. Hey, Zach, sorry to interrupt. We had a question come in that I thought was relevant to uh, normal. Okay. Don't interrupt, but somebody asked, what's the size of this property? This property, so right here, I'm only showing probably the north 150 acres. It was about a 400 acre property. So it continued on to the, the south, um, southeast. Um, this property, like I said, it was about 440, I think total. Um, most of the properties I'm working on, you know, I work anywhere down to 15 acres all the way up through, I have some properties well over a thousand acres. So it's really dependent on the area, you know, out west, the properties get a little bigger. Um, and it, it, it really depends, you know, more so than property size. A lot of times it's the property shape itself that kind of dictates a lot of these different habitat techniques and how you can, how you can get them implemented on the landscape, but still manage to have good access and be able to hunt them. So I hope that answers your question. It's a long-winded answer for uh, probably about 150 acres, maybe 200 um, just for this section of that farm. So right here I have, um, one of my favorite Leopold quotes, I thought it'd be a good way to kick things off. Um, one of the penalties of an ecological education is that one lives alone in a world of wounds. Much of the damage inflicted on the land is quite invisible to laymen. An ecologist must either harden his shell and make believe that consequences of science are none of his business, or he must be the doctor who sees the marks of death in a community that believes well on itself and does not want to be told otherwise. So. Again, Leop I'm a Leopold disciple, I'd call myself. The guy was way ahead of his time. Back in the 20s and 30s, he's having ideas like this, the community concept, the land ethic. And he's right, being an ecologist, you know, people ask me all the time, getting into to my profession, it's a dream come true, right? And I'm like, yeah, but you got to think about it. It's the same way I'm sure a doctor goes to an amusement park and sees everybody with the sniffles and starts trying to diagnose everybody. Every time I go on a hike anywhere, I'm always looking at the non-native plants. I'm trying to figure out how that area was mismanaged. Um, I, I see all the wounds and big part of my job is undoing those wounds that humanity has caused on the landscape. We've, we've done so much harm and, and 
you know, just, just educating others. That's my favorite part of my job is just opportunities like this, where I get to educate others on how to take better care of the, the land that they own or manage. So why are we here? Um, because we love nature, sure. We all love nature. Uh, trying to combat climate change, that'd be fantastic if we could have a little bit of an impact on that. Are you here because we're worried about soil health and honeybees? Yeah, I'm worried about them a little bit, but um, we're here because we want to shoot bigger deer. You know, there's no, there's nothing wrong with wanting to shoot bigger deer. Right here, this deer is a, uh, we named this deer, I worked on a, on a ranch in Texas right after graduating um, college. And this was the first 200 inch deer ever shot off of that ranch. Um, for those unfamiliar, when you're scoring deer, there's a scoring, uh, there's a way you score their antlers and you come up with a, a inches, total inches for that scorable deer. Um, this deer, like I said, it was the first one to score over 200 inches for that ranch. That ranch, we weren't a high fence, or we were a high fence ranch, but we weren't um, breeding the deer. We didn't have any sort of breeding facilities or um, pin deer or anything like that. So these are all natural bred deer. Um, getting to 200 inches is a big deal in hill country. So it took time. It took a lot of time. That manager's been out there for 20 years now until they got their first 200 inch deer but as I said hard work pays off there's no shame in wanting to shoot bigger deer yeah we can I can talk all day long about how I love what I'm doing for songbirds and pollinator habitat or you know brooding habitat for for quail and turkey poults you know there's there's so many cool things that I'm doing on a daily basis across the country on all these places but at the end of the day, there's nothing wrong with saying that we're doing all this great conservation work in the name of harvesting a bigger animal. Don't let shortcuts or gimmicks distract you from the basics. As I said, we, this call it a deer management thing's been going on a long time. We kind of know what we're doing. And, and let's face it, people, people want shortcuts. They like, they like easy. Sweat equity can go a long way. Um, there's no substitute for time. That's a big one. I'm going to keep talking about age and time, and there's there's just no way around it. You got to lay off that trigger. The, there's no substitute for quality habitat. You can buy bedding in a bag, or you can go out there and um, you could think you're doing the right thing. Even even a prescribed fire, something everybody wants to do. If you do the pre prescribed fire at the wrong time of year or in the wrong spot, you can actually be harming yourself. You know, you, you could be doing it. Say I'm trying to manage a, a field of native warm season grasses and I run a, a dormant season fire through it and there's Johnson grass in that field. You know, that's a non-native warm season grass and all of a sudden it likes fire and you got a field full of Johnson grass. You know, taking the time to figure out what you're doing and doing it right is going to save you down the road from having to do things over again. So no substitute for quality habitat, no shortcuts there. And the only substitute for good luck is a good plan. All right, so what factors into a buck's ability to reach his full potential? I've split this up into four categories. A lot of people have three categories, maybe five categories, but these are just different factors that influence a deer's potential to reach his or her full size body-wise and wise. So age is the first one. Um, that's the most important one. It takes five years to grow a five-year-old buck. You know, there's no way around it. This deer, um, his name was Bender. And notice I say was because that was that velvet deer laying in the brassica plot at the beginning of the presentation two years later. So he grew nicely. I gave him those two years and he returned the favor. There he is. Incredible, incredible change. He probably put on, I don't know, 30 inches. Nutrition. We all love baby deer. Nothing cuter than a baby deer. And we love soybeans. I know Luke's a big uh, soybean guy over there, so I included that one. Stress. This is one that nobody's talking about. Stress, it, it's hard to talk about because you can't see it. It's not tangible. You know, it doesn't have a very, very real impact. But this is one of those factors that everything that I do is to minimize stress on these animals. So whether that's you know social stress from having too many animals around, whether that's environmental stress, there's nowhere to go when it gets freezing cold out. You know, I'm all about trying to minimize stress on these animals. I want them to put as much energy as they can into growing their body size and antlers as possible. As you can tell, stress here is a, a CWD positive deer on the left. Um, 
that's one form of stress, you know, environmental stress coming from um, pathogens. Another form of stress over here, this image on the right was, um, it was Hawaii. I believe that was Maui is where this image was taken. These are axis deer. They were gifted to the island way back when um, to some prince or royal and they've just gone gangbusters out there. As you can tell, there's no understory anywhere. It looks like an African savanna. This used to be rainforest country. Too many mouths to feed on the landscape. I'm going to tell you those deer out there, they might look like they have no predators. They run the place, but they're probably, I'm sure they're stressed. They got that social stress going on. Food looks like a limiting resource out there. And they're eating themselves out of house and home. The same thing can happen. Genetics. This is last on the list for a reason. And I'll get into that at the end of the presentation. But genetics are one of those things where do they matter? Yes. Um, but how much can you actually do about them? So I put them low on the list for a reason. Here's that deer high top again. And there's a high fence pin deer. So that's what genetics will get you. Or, I don't know, $30,000. Age versus antler growth. This is the big one. So when I'm talking about age structure, like I said before, it takes five years to grow a five-year-old deer. When I'm looking at managing a property, most often when I'm giving advice to a landowner as to, you know, how where do you set that benchmark for a shooter buck on their property? Uh, I, like I said, 80, 90% of the time, I'm leaning at four and a half years old. If you're looking at this chart here, this is a wonderful graph. Again, um, National Deer Association has some awesome graphics depicting all this stuff. But if you're looking at that four and a half year old uh, on the x-axis there, he's already above 90% of his uh, average potential uh, antler size for his lifetime. So when I'm looking at this as a cost benefit analysis, if I can get that deer to three and a half, great. If I can get him to four and a half, fantastic. Between four and a half and six and a half, he might only put on 6% more growth, 7% more growth. You know, he's not going to get that much bigger. His antler configuration might change. He might lose a few points. He might get a little more mass on him. He might get a little wider. He, it's going to change, but as far as what he's going to score, it's not going to change all that much. So when you're, especially on smaller properties, four and a half years old is fantastic. If you're down into less than a hundred acres, even a three and a half year old might be a good target for you. If you got neighbors that are pretty trigger happy, you know, but finding that sweet spot, four and a half, like I said, you're, you're above 90% of what they're ever going to score on average. Um, and it gets you where you want to be. You, you, that deer is just as likely to get shot by a neighbor those next two years, five and a half, six and a half years old. Um, I, I just feel like your best opportunity to make the most out of your property is going to be targeting those four and a half year olds. You're never going to get all of them. A couple of them are probably going to pass on to five and a half. Great. Like I said, I managed my deer for four and a half year old deer. That deer in the previous slide, high top, he was four and a half. Bender, he was a four and a half year old deer and I harvested him. Um, that you can pretty much tell where they're going to be once they reach that age. Uh, as I said, that, that curve kind of levels off after four and a half years old. Here's the thing. We're trying to flood that region with two and a half and three and a half year old deers. These are your sacrificial deer. They're on the landscape. You know, it'd be great if every single one of them can make it through to that four and a half year mark. That's just not the case. You know, we're hunting we're hunting deer with low, you know, they're free ranging. They can go from your property, your neighbors, they might end up in the next county over for all we know during the rut. So again, it, as many of those two and a half and three and a half year olds you can leave out there on the landscape, that's somebody else punching their tag and going home and hopefully more of those three and a half and four and a half kind of make it back onto your property. There's always exceptions when you're talking about antler growth. Um, injuries will set them back a year um the next year they might have a big jump so if i have a deer that's three and a half years old and he has a bad injury during summer and he doesn't develop into what he's going to look i might give him a pass until five and a half because it might take a year for him to bounce back all right age this deer here this is high top so this is that deer at the beginning of the show i was standing with this is him at one and a half two and a half years old, three and a half years old. These were the sheds that I found that were laying in front of them there. And then there he was at four and a half. So just look at that. Look at how much he grows. It's 
It's incredible. There's, like I said, I'm going to say it a thousand times. There's no substitute for time. You just got to give these deer the opportunity. This three and a half year old deer, high top, when he was three and a half years old, I found those antlers. I measured, I taped them out conservatively, you know, 153 inches. That's a great deer. That's a trophy deer. Anyone would be happy with that deer, but look at what he turned into. He ended up scoring 182, 183 inches, had a couple crazy i think he had like 16 scorable points but it was just because we didn't harvest them at three and a half we gave him that extra year we have good habitat good nutrition around nutrition number two nutritional bottleneck so a nutritional bottleneck is the time of year when nutritional resources are most scarce so oftentimes when you're looking at at the mid-atlantic or most of the country in that case it's going to be that, that late winter, you know, anytime from December through through March through spring green up. Um, diagnosing these nutritional bottlenecks is going to be very dependent on where you are and even even down to the, the county. You know, if your neighbors are, are all ag producers, you got plenty of soybeans all summer long. Um, I wouldn't worry about planting soybeans on your place. You know, it's it's all part of figuring out where those nutritional bottlenecks are going to be. If, if you're in a region like that where it's all heavy crops, your nutritional bottleneck is not going to be in the summertime while those soybeans are growing. You know, that nutritional bottleneck, excuse me, is going to be in the fall or winter after those crops have been picked clean. What does the rest of your neighbor's properties look like? You know, are they taking care of the woodlots? Are they planting perennial, you know, buffers around their, their fields? I doubt it. If you're nothing but woods around, you know, what are your woods providing when, when the acorns aren't falling? So many people put all their eggs in that basket. They're waiting for that big bumper crop year. They're going to get out there. They got a wide oak stand. They're ready to go. Well, crops fail. You know, you're not going to get a good acorn crop every year. So figuring out what is that property providing um, when those acorns aren't falling, you know, if, if it's an old growth forest, let's say there's nothing at ground level for those deer to consume, your property is only going to provide food while those acorns are on the ground. The rest of the year, you're not providing much of anything. So late winter, early spring is generally when food is most scarce. What's happening December to May? Let's think about it. So those does are pregnant, you know, they were bred in November, they're pregnant, they're carrying, they might still have a fawn or two with them from the year before. Um, they're dropping fawns um, towards the end of that May, June. Um, they're dropping fawns, very calorie. Um, they need a ton of calories. They need a lot of energy to be able to, to, to carry that baby. The bucks, they're going through rut. But that's why the rut is so exciting. Those, those bucks can lose up to 30% of their body weight because they're running around, you know, chasing the girls they need to replenish all those resources and fat stores, you know? So December to May is kind of that time period where there's not much on the landscape, but those bucks are so dependent on recouping what they lost because they were running so hard. So what do you have out there for them that time of year? All right, what about May to August? You know, the does are lactating. That's huge caloric um, deficit for them. They got to overcome, especially if they have twins. Think about how many calories that takes to provide uh, milk and uh, milk for those those fawns to, to grow and be healthy. The bucks are in velvet. Again, you might get an inch of antler growth a day. It's incredible. They, they, like all of these calories, this all kind of feeds into each other. These, these things, they eat a lot. Ask, ask your producers in the area. Deer like to eat. Uh, fawns are growing like wheat. So they're starting to wean. They're getting weaned. They're starting to eat hard foods. Um, very important time to have food on the landscape. So if you're in ag heavy country and they're not planting until the end of May, what are you providing during that crucial time period for these deer? So I just want to get you guys kind of thinking in that mindset, you know, what, what time of year on my property am I dealing with uh, the most stress for these animals when it comes to getting their, their meals? Okay, true or false, agriculture crops constitute most of the deer's nutritional intake when they are available. False. Even in states like Illinois, Iowa, Wisconsin, crops only constitute a fraction of the deer's daily intake. Yes, even when soybeans are available. Okay, so what are deer eating if they're not only eating crops? Another great graphic from the National Deer Association. This one, I, 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 <laughs> I love this. So crops. 
what do you notice about crops? It's about ten you percent know, for the whole year. So let's let's assume, even if they were going to include soybeans as um, you know forbs um, for them, it's still going to be what forty percent at the most, 30, 40 percent of that deer's daily diet is going to be those soybeans. So you're looking at all this browse, all these mass, you know, grasses, lichens. There's so much here. A majority of a deer's diet isn't coming from from that tillable ground. They're walking around, they're browsing all day long. Where they're laying down, chewing their cud, they get up, stretch their legs, they're eating on, you know, the twigs of a spice bush or a box elder or whatever's laying around. They're constantly eating. It's just those, those peak feeding times where we see them in the food plot. I think our misunderstanding, our misinterpretation of what deer are eating comes from their visibility. You know, they're out in the open in a food plot. That's where we see them most often. So I think we associate uh, deer with those crop fields more so than they're actually browsing in their diet. Why is this important for a land manager? Let's, uh, let's take a minute to think about what's going on here. When I look across the board at most people doing uh, land management for, with the intention of growing bigger deer, I'd say 75% of the time they're spending on their property promoting deer habitat is going into food plots. Now, there's nothing wrong with that. I love food plots. I recommend them all the time. I plant them every year. I plant them multiple times a year. But I'm not putting all of my eggs in that basket. Look at all this other stuff I can be doing with the browse. You know, what can I do to improve browse? Let's cut some trees down. Let's have a timber harvest. Let's, you know, do some TSI projects. Forbes, let's spray out those cool season grasses. Let's try to promote some, <clears throat> excuse me, let's try to promote some wildflower species on the landscape, you know, native wildflower species on the landscape. If you just do those two things, if you start to open up that canopy, you start to get some stump sprouts and you start to get some young forest habitat around, some wildflowers establishing, you, like looking at that old field management, like right before it becomes a young forest, You've got the bulk of that deer's calorical intake all year long already on site. So no food plots needed right there. What can landowners do to increase the abundance of forbs and browse? Now, you know, I touched on this earlier, forest and improvements. Um, early successional habitats, these are two of the big ones. So let's go through some forest and improvements. A crop tree release. Crop tree release is simply going in and finding a crop tree. So let's say we'd find a nice white oak. You know, this one, it produces good acorns every year. We like this tree. Your favorite stands in it, whatever. You got your tree. You want to promote more acorns off of that one oak tree. So they've looked into this time and time again, scientists, universities. You can't, you can't fertilize an oak tree to produce more acorns. It's just not going to work. You can put all the fertilizer spikes you want underneath that oak tree. You're not going to get a higher yield because of it. What does help improve the amount of um, the amount of oaks hitting the ground? So it's the amount of sunlight that tree's getting. It's the amount of water that 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 tree can get. So how do we do that? We're going to take down the trees that are directly competing for crown space with your target tree. So that's a crop tree release. We're getting rid of any tree directly competing with the tree you're trying to promote. Patch cuts, temporary forest openings. <clears throat> you know these are all. Um, depending on where you look, if you're looking through the NRCS, they'll probably call them a patch cut or a temporary forest opening. If I'm writing a management plan and I'm talking about deer, I might call it a, uh, a bedding thicket. It's the same management technique. It's a micro clear cut. Just you're disturbing what once was a closed canopy forest. You're taking a section of that canopy out of there. You're letting sunlight hit the ground. You're letting some of those trees to re-sprout. You're creating a, a temporary forest opening. Edge feathering is another great project. Anytime, anytime you're going to see a uh, um, woodlot butt up against an open field, there's going to be you know that hard tree line there. A lot of the mid Atlantic when I'm when I'm working out there, you'll notice the browse lines where all those deer have ate everything from um, from there down. The uh, edge feathering is a way to improve that. So edge feathering is when you get in there. And you, uh, you're decreasing the amount of canopy along that field edge. So you're going, it might be 50% of the trees you're removing from that field edge. You're trying to get sunlight to penetrate further into that woodlot. You're creating a smooth transition where all of a sudden you just had a mature timber and field. All of a sudden you got field, young forest, you know, shrubs going into that old field. So it's just kind of tapering off that hard field edge 
creating an extra edge. Invasive plant treatment. You know, this is like I said, I'm, a, I'm an invasive plant's worst nightmare. I got stung in the ankle yesterday, ripping a tree of heaven out of the ground by a hornet <laughs> that was hiding underneath it. Um, I'm the guy that'll go on a hike at the county park and start yanking bush honeysuckle out of the ground when I can or privet or whatever I'm dealing with. So um, treating those invasive species, there's a reason they're so prevalent, you know, not many things like eating them. Sure, I can see a deer browsing on, on Japanese honeysuckle every now and then, but they're not going to go out of their way to browse on that stuff. You know, these deer are North American natives. They're, they evolved here to be eating our native, you know, flowers and trees and shrubs and grasses. And all of a sudden we got a bombardment of all these different plants that aren't usable for these wildlife species we have out here. So cleaning them out, making room for our natives to establish is gonna, gonna work wonders for not only the white tail, but all the other animals on the landscape. In doing timber harvest, I know a lot of people get get kind of prickly about the the, the term timber harvest, but let's face it, we we're good at it. We've been doing timber harvest a long time. You know, it's it's a controlled disturbance. It goes a long ways. It's getting a lot of people to carry a lot of that heavy lifting off of your management shoulders um, by getting someone else in there. And you might even make some money off of it. Early successional habitats, you might hear them called old field management. That's just letting fields go fallow and manipulating them, getting rid of, of whatever problem species you don't want and trying to encourage those species that you do want. Prescribed fire is a great tool to kind of manipulate that. Again, herbicide is going to be another one. Um, if you're really thick with fescue or cool season grass in these old field plots, you know, hit them after the first frost with a grass selective herbicide or even Roundup and knock them back and, and, and go from there. You, it, it's not rocket science. We're just trying to promote a nice, lush um, growth of native vegetation on the landscape. Native warm season grasses and forbs. There's plenty of programs around. You can go, go through the NRCS. There, there's some funding opportunities available for landowners um, to be able to do some of these habitat projects. There's a lot of funding available right now for pollinators and stuff. So if you love butterflies, if you love songbirds, if, if you want to get some of that on your landscape, there is opportunities for you as a landowner to, to get a little assistance with those. Fallow crop fields, another one of the management techniques I do on a regular basis if I can afford to. If we have standing corn out there, I'm going to let it go fallow for a year. You know, you'll get a lot of daisies and, and vines creeping up in there, but those fallow cornfields are already in rows. So you might have 27 inch row spacing. Um, there's bare dirt exposed. It's uh, aerial, you know, protection from, from if doe wants to drop her fawns in there or if a turkey poult wants to look for insects, you know, they got coverage. They're not exposed, um, so fallow crop fields are a great way to add some early successional habitat. And you don't have to do anything. You're not doing something. You're leaving that field alone for a year. Planted perennial fire breaks, another quick one to help ensure the, uh, the productivity of these um, native warm season grasses and forbs. I like, I'm a big fan of planting perennial fire breaks around the end, around the outside perimeters of these. Um, your fire breaks are already ready to go. Whenever you get good conditions, you can go out there and you can burn because that, that clover is there. The other benefit I like about doing that approach is a lot of times when you're establishing those, those plant communities, deer will target specific native plants that they like, you know, black eyed Susan, tree foil. They'll go in there and they can actually knock them out of the, uh, knock them off the landscape. They, they, they target them so hard. So if I can get some high quality clover around those, warm season grasses and forbs and try to fill their bellies a little bit or dilute it before they get into those fields. I'm, I'm thinking they're not gonna target those species I wanna give an opportunity to establish out there. Here's a great example. So like I said, my farm's in South Central Kentucky. Um, tillable ground is at an absolute premium. A lot of people get the mindset that if you have tillable ground, it should be a food plot, has to go in a food plot. Here's an example where we took uh, it's about a five acre field out of um, production. So I took it out of out of corn soybean production and planted it in native warm season grasses and forbs. I took this picture literally yesterday. As you can tell, my golden rods, my blue stems are kind of hard to see there. Um, a little bit of sycamore encroachment going on in the foreground, but beautiful. That is what quality habitat looks like. OK. Um, is you get a lot of freedom, a lot of freedom managing these plant communities. You know, I can do patch burns out there. I can do whatever I want with it, but 
at the end of the day, it's great habitat, great place for a doe to drop a fawn, um, and it's beautiful. Here's an example of an edge feather. This is from my client's property in Illinois. So you can tell, um, you might be familiar with what a browse line looks like on a field edge where it's kind of like you can see right back into the timber. Well, an edge feather kind of creates the opposite effect. You're making it nice and thick right there on the edge by increasing the amount of sunlight and availability for, um, for other species to establish. So kind of the opposite of your browse line there. That's what an edge feather will look like after it's starting to establish a little bit. Here's a TSI technique called a hack and squirt. That's actually my, my grandfather's old hatchet. Um, when he passed away, he left a bunch of tools to my dad. And uh, I kind of acquired that hatchet as my hack and squirt hatchet. So uh, here I'm treating a, a locust tree. You're going to hack into it. You're going to spray your herbicide there. And you're going to kill that tree, leave it standing. Those locust trees will stay standing forever. <laughs> and it's a really hard wood um great for for habitat you know the woodpeckers will move in and then you can get songbirds or flying squirrels moving into those nest cavities um and then i just want to include one of my clients with his two boys last year um this is what it's all about getting the kids involved teaching them you know what hard work is like what what the fruits of your labor can be like and just getting them exposed to the outdoors you know i feel i feel so blessed to be in an opportunity where i can help set people up for success like that and sharing those types of memories okay here's the big one stress what do i mean by stress there's different types of stress social stress look at all these white tail they're, uh, these does are getting ready to, to fight each other. This young buck standing there. They're, there is such a thing as having too many deer. I know everybody wants to go out there and they want to sit down and see 30 deer every time they sit. But is that good for your deer herd? No. And you know, you got to start worrying about disease transmission. You got to worry about how much food is on the landscape. You got to start worrying about your forest regeneration. You know, if you got too many deer out there and you're trying to get some oak regeneration after a timber harvest, those deer might not allow that to happen they're going to start browsing those those oak seedlings and, and really change they're going to transform what that forest looks like down the road so social stress is a big one physiological stress disease injury you know stuff that stuff like disease some of that can be avoided you know if it's legal in your state and you can provide supplements a lot of those supplements are going to help with their immune system a lot of those salts and stuff this deer to the right um, believe it or not, tested positive for CWD. Looks like a healthy deer to me, I'd say. So you never quite know. Thermal stress. So I did a write-up last year um, for, Q for National Deer Association talking about thermal stress and, and what it does to these animals during the summertime. So everyone, when they talk about thermal stress on a, on a whitetail, most people jump to the wintertime. What can I provide when there's three inches of snow or three foot of snow on the ground and those deer got to eat? Well, the same can be said during the summertime. Even even in you know my clients' properties in Minnesota, you think of Minnesota as being a cold place, and yeah, I'm gonna stress having yarding grounds for these for these deer. But at the end of the day, it still gets 100 degrees in the summertime out there. So what are you providing for those deer in the summertime? You know, deer can't sweat. That's when <laughs> they, they pant when you see them running they're panting they're trying to expel all that heat through their mouth so it's very when they start changing their behavior because of because of the the temperature stress it tells me that we need to do something to make good quality shade habitat or wintertime thermal habitat available for those deer on the landscape we, do, we don't want them to be having to move too far to get comfortable all right last but not least um genetics this is the one that i don't enjoy talking about it's all anybody seemingly wants to talk about when it comes to the big bucks is their genetics what are their genetics like this area has great genetics that area their genetics stink <laughs> you know there's the people people like talking about genetics but as a land manager there's only so much you can do so what do we know about genetics on average a mature a mature shooter buck will do little more than replace himself in a herd that's right. If you look at the lifespan of that one buck, if he produces one mature trophy animal to replace himself, then he did his job. If you're if you're under the impression that that deer's just churning out trophies one after the next, that's that's not how it works. 
Okay, genetics, 50% of every deer's genetics comes from the doe. Now, a lot of people don't think about that. You know, we're all looking at those antlers and judging genetics based on those antlers, but you gotta, you gotta think every time that fawn is born, 50% of his genes are coming from his mom. Culling has an extremely limited impact on free ranging deers. Um, there's all sorts of studies out there. I hear it all the time. Once a spike, always a spike. You know, it's a common theme. Um, he, there's there's a time and a place for it. I don't think that if, if you want to start doing culling and if you truly want to have the best genetics on your property, my best advice would be make sure that your does on your property are as young as possible. Reason being, if you it, it's fairly easy to tell a, a young one or two year old doe apart from a five or six year old doe. If you can keep your property in those one and two year old does, they're going to have the most, they're going to be bred from the most recent bucks on your property. So um, by keeping those does genetics, and the reason I'm talking about doe management is a young buck when he's born and becomes one year old, when that, when his mom goes to drop the next year's spawns, she's chasing him out of town. He's going to disperse five to 10 miles away. He's going to set up a new home base. So the bucks born on your property are not, the, are not the bucks you are going to be hunting on your property in most instances. The does you're hunting on your property most likely were born on your property. So that's what I'm talking about when you're dealing with genetics. If we can focus on keeping a young um, herd of does on the landscape instead of having all those old does out there, your, your genetics are going to be more current, with, more reflective of what's currently out there on the landscape, you know, there's what you can see. I want to take a moment to talk about a quick study to kind of prove my point as far as genetics not making as big of an impact as most people think they have. So this study took place in South Dakota, um, and you can see in these top pictures, these deer were from two different sides of the state. Um, the deer from the Black Hills on the left, and then the deer is from eastern South Dakota on the right. So this is what those cohorts of deer look like when they first brought them into the testing facilities. So they bred them, um, they brought in pregnant does, those does dropped their fawns, and those fawns were raised on the same diet, same conditions, and these were the deer that they looked like when they grew up here in this top picture. They did the same thing with deer bred from these two bucks in the same facility. They bred, do they bred does, those does dropped buck fawns. They gave those buck fawns the same diet. So this one again was from the Eastern side of the state on the right. The one on the left is from the Black Hills on the Western side of the state. Those are both great deer in that bottom picture. The only difference was the nutrition provided to that doe while she was pregnant. So the deer in the top, they had completely different upbringings. The mother did while she was pregnant. These bucks were in utero. They were inside their mother. While those does were, the doe on the left was stressed out. You know, she didn't get a full, her, her pregnancy was more stressful than this doe on the right. She had more resources available to her. If you level the playing field, those same hereditary lines, level the playing field, give them the same genetics, you'd be hard pressed. This deer on the right might be a little bit bigger, but those are both great deer. And it just goes to show you that filling that nutritional void in the calendar while that doe was pregnant, that would have been, you know, during the summertime, or during the during the late winter, early springtime is going to produce larger deer down the road. So it's an interesting concept to grapple with. You want healthy does on the landscape. It's the same way where if you look in a hospital and there's there's a a, a child born from a, a drug addict or something where she the mother might have been malnourished. The, the, the baby's more likely to be premature or undersized. The same thing happens with livestock. The same thing happens with deer. And again, this, this is not genetics. This is nutrition. This goes to prove you their genetics are fine. The deer from the Black Hills genetics are absolutely fine. It's a nutritional battle that they're dealing with with the smaller sizes. All right, let me, um, I think I went three minutes over from, from where I was at. Again, if you guys have any questions at all, feel free to send me an email, reach out to me. Um, there is my contact information, and I appreciate you guys listening. Thank you, Zach. That was great. Um, it's great to hear all the different ideas you had. And I, I know I had a few questions that I was jotting down as we went through, but we had a few come in from our audience um, that look really good. Uh, so I'll start at the, at the top. And uh, the first one that came in early on was uh, from uh, Ma Omega. Uh, 
is if you are after timber production and deer are browsing your next crop excessively, what's the best strategy for herd reduction? Start inviting friends in um, to hunt. Do a doe derby. Um, people get stingy with their properties. They're not wanting people to share. Um, there's so many great opportunities out there. I've turned a lot of my clients onto like the Hunters Feed the Hungry program. I, I don't know what it is. I, I tell people to go out there and harvest more does and to take their antlerless management more seriously. And you'd think I'd tell them to go pull their own teeth. Um, it's fun. You know, antlerless management, it, there's no way around it. Like I said, you can bring people in, send invites out, allow people to come in, put some parameters around it, say, hey, um, we're doing a doe derby. Let's see, you can shoot the biggest doe this weekend. Um, short of, of that, there's, there's not many options. You, you know, you have, you have arrows and you have bullets. Those are, those are the main two, uh, strategies for reducing the herd size. And to define doe derby, is that mostly just a, just an internal sort of setup where you have this group of people decide we're going to see who can get the most or who can get the heaviest and you have some sort of prizes set up or something like yeah, that. Yeah, it's kind of a play on the old buck pole pictures you'll see where people have eight deer hanging upside down see who's got the biggest buck. Um, I, I tell people try to do a competition out of it. So you can shoot the biggest doe, the oldest doe, the heaviest doe, you know, wh whatever it is, try to make it fun. Put a prize package and, you know, I don't know, dinner's you don't have to pay for dinner. Dinner is on me, if whoever gets the biggest dough, whatever it is. Um, like I was saying, it, it's amazing to me how, how difficult it can be to, to convince people to, to go hunt more. Um, I think the antler this part, like I was joking with you yesterday, Luke, where uh, I, I, I pride myself in all this habitat management, this habitat work. But at the end of the day, you know, my free advice to anybody is shoot more antlerless does and quit shooting young bucks. Learn to, you learn to age bucks on the hook. Um, your property is going to be exponentially better down the road if you can just do those two things. Cool. Great. Next one we had up was from Matthew Reno. And he asked, he's been conducting some small scale half to one acre timber stand improvement in his 42 acre wooded property, particularly to remove mature beech trees. His goal is to establish a more diverse, dense understory throughout his property. About three to four years after TSI, he has significant sweet gum regeneration that is incredibly dense. Should these sweet gums be thinned uh, when in sapling stage in these areas? Yeah, I, I would treat them immediately. Go in there. You could even foliar spray them um, or mow them down and, and spray the stump sprouts. I don't, I don't know how they big or how big they are at this point, but the sooner you can treat those sweet gums, the better. Um, again, they're a native tree. They kind of act as a weed tree. I put them in the same category as like the Eastern red cedar. We're like, are we ever going to get rid of all of them on the landscape? No. And that's never my intent. Um, but when they are opportunistic and they do kind of act as a weed tree and they'll, they'll establish more vigorously than, than some of these other trees that we're that we're trying to promote so i would say be aggressive with it yeah treat them early what herbicide do you recommend for that i i, I have some i was gonna let you say it i i think garlon is a recommended one i think there's two types of garlon one is for mature trees and the other is for foliar yeah uh, i was I gonna say i was gonna say garlon is is fine trichopyr probably work um cool Make sure you read the label on all those herbicides. Yeah, follow, um, follow herbicide labels. Um, and again, if, if they're small, it might be something where you, you can do like a basil bark treatment or just, it all depends. Each, each treatment's different. But um, if they're small enough, you can get away with just doing a foliar spray. Um, I would try to go that approach. Cool. Cool. Okay. Matthew had a follow-up. He said, what's your position on Controlled burning in completely wooded areas with a majority of trees being nine to 20 inch DBH, maple, beeches, poplars, gum, and oaks. It's not going to hurt much, but I, I would worry you won't get much of a response. Um, you're just not getting enough sunlight there unless you can open up that canopy a little bit, whether it be hack and squirt or, you know, just do or girdle some of those trees. Try to get some sunlight down there. A lot of people get, get, um, you know, disheartened where they'll do a prescribed burn, it'll go great. And then they come back and they're not getting the response they thought they would get. Well, they didn't take the time to go in there and remove that canopy. If you're burning a shaded area, you're not encouraging any more sunlight to hit the ground. So even though you're getting rid of that leaf litter, you're not, you're still missing part of the equation to be able to promote that, that shrubby or poor habitat that you're trying to get to. 
So maybe that's something you'd integrate in with some of your 10 percent improvement potentially. Yep, I would I would focus on the TSI first, getting in there and treating some of those bigger canopy trees. And then um, after the, the canopy reduction, I would follow up with the fire. That's great. Uh, Nick Vincent asked, and I answered, took the liberty to answer this one. He asked if you have any recommended resources for identifying invasive plants. And I sent him to the Invasives of the Mid-Atlantic Guide that the National Park Service put together, which is really comprehensive. And so I use uh, an app too. called Seek to help me identify plants. If I don't know what they are, mm -hmm. that'll also tell me if they're native or non-native. But do you have other guides for invasives that you like? Um, I use, uh, what was it? I uh, iNaturalist. I'm still an iNaturalist. It's the one that I'm most frequently. Um, it works pretty good. It'll get you pointed in the right direction. Don't don't take it as fact. Um, <laughs> that's yep. that's one thing I would always take. You know, take a picture and verify when you get home. But for out in the field, seek um, is a good one. iNaturalist. That uh, I heard I heard good things about picture this. I have not used that app yet. But um, yeah, there's some. Good I think it's out. a paid. If I recall, I think I tried. I'm not sure if it's picture this or plant another one, but it was paid. And so I haven't oh, used out. it, but <laughs> some of them are pretty good. Yeah. Uh, cool. Uh, but yeah, the, the apps are just getting so amazing. Um, so Matthew followed up uh, on what's the value. And this is something I had a question of the value of mature beech trees, about 30 inch DBH diameter breast height on a property where the goal is to grow healthy deer. What's, what's the wildlife value? yeah what, what do you put on there and i was and the, the thing i was going to also mention is i have you know beaches do put out beach nuts mm -hmm. and i think i have seen deer browsing some of those under our leaf litter from time to time and maybe some other birds or other animals uh raccoons and possums and things but i'm curious if you have any thoughts on beach nuts and mm -hmm. or yeah do they have any sort of contribution in your mind yeah so the beach nut itself it, it, will a deer eat a beach nut sure um, are they going to go out of their way and are they going to target beech nuts like they like they would say a white oak acorn or a chinkling acorn? Um, no, they're, they're not. As far as wildlife value goes, those big those big beech trees, you know, if you're looking at non-game species, they're tremendously valuable. You know, almost every single one of them is going to be hollow. You got raccoons living in them, flying squirrels. Um, even looking at the, in the springtime when those seeds are establishing, those little samaras, um, the songbirds get in there and they start picking at those things early. Like they have some good wildlife value, but as far as for deer go, um, I, I don't think it's adding that much value to the deer. I would, I would rather see an area like that. Um, if you can leave that beech tree standing and, and, and treat it with like a hack and squirt or something, it's gonna be taken up so much. And the other thing about the beech trees, even in the winter time, they're holding on to the leaves. You know, so so they're shading that area well into the dormant season when other species, you know, like an oak, like a maple, their their leaves are already gone. So like you might not have to kill a maple tree in an area to to get the sunlight on the ground, but if it's a beech tree sitting there, it's still going to hold those leaves until very very late in the winter time before it drops them. So I'd say as a wildlife value goes, um, not very high on the list for deer. Yeah, I also find they're very common. So it's one of those things is is have some diversity. And if it's a very dominant species, yeah, it opens up more opportunities for, for different things to come in. Yeah. Like sweet gum, right? Yeah. Good time. <laughs> um, cool. Uh, next up, uh, Woody Shields asked, and Woody, we might ask for a little bit of clarification on what you mean by formations, but he, he asked different formations have large differences in levels of natural nutrients, maybe soil formations, perhaps. What are your thoughts on the nutrients available from different formations? Yeah, I'm not sure I understand the question. Let's see if he, yeah, let's see if he, uh, we'll go to the next one, but Woody, if you have a chance to elaborate on formations and if you mean like different types of soils, um, let us know. He had a follow-up as well. What is your thoughts on the history of MSY? And I'm guessing maybe he means maximum sustainable yield. On that one like dough harvest how to how to establish like a like a dough quota is that what he's asking about uh i think um well let's mm -hmm. woody let us know if msy stands for maximum sustainable yield and we can we'll come back to that what if you're still on uh shoot us shoot us some uh clarifications in the text and we'll we'll move on to a couple of these other questions and come back to those because i have some thoughts if it's msy i have some thoughts on that as well right. um Soil formations from rocky rivers. 
Okay, from rock erosion. Okay, so does that? Um... Have large implementing nutrients. What are your thoughts on nutrients available from different formations? So you're asking about using different different soil types and stuff to to determine which um, plant communities are going to establish there. Is that kind of the route you're going with that question? Um, and what do you feel free to unmute if you'd like and and if you'd like to ask your questions? Yeah, and MSY is maximum sustainable yield. So. What are your thoughts on nutrients? So it sounds like, um, I, I guess I would try to tackle this question. I'm curious if you have any thoughts, Zach. Um, so yeah, if you have different types of soils uh, and you have different nutri nutrients, what I would think is you would end up growing different types of plant communities. Mm -hmm. And those plants yeah. might also then have different nutrient levels or the same plant might have slightly different nutrient levels based on the soil types in their yeah. leaf tissue. Uh huh. Yep. Yeah. So I see it in different areas of my farm. So like a common, a common, I'll call it a weed <laughs> that I'm dealing with is giant ragweed. And you'll see like down near the creek where you get lots of flooding and alluvial soil deposits. Um, some of that giant ragweed will be 14 foot tall. Where I look at other parts of my farm and it might only be six or seven feet tall. Um, there are going to be different species that are going to establish in different areas. You know, it kind of all feeds into that patchwork and different habitat types. That's one of the reasons, like when I'm looking at establishing a native prairie or an old field or something. Yeah, it, the predictability of getting in there and planting something is great. You kind of know what to expect, but at the same time, you can't see the different, you know, soil types on a micro level or the low spots where it might have more clay holding there, and, you know, more saturated. So there's going to be different layers and different effectiveness of those plantings. So whenever I'm looking at establishing, say, an old field, I'm going to go out there. I would rather, you know, start from scratch and see what that native seed bank has um, because when you run into areas where you have different types of soil types or different conditions, environmental conditions, chances are there's going to be something in that seed bank holding there that is going to be able to establish there, something native that that's going to have a, as long as you give it an opportunity, it'll be willing to take over and take advantage of it. Cool. And for the maximum sustainable yield question, um, so I'll back up on this one, and I'm not sure exactly what part of the history uh, you're thinking about, Woody, but the whole idea behind maximum sustainable yield is that by uh, if you had a deer population at carrying capacity, births equal deaths. So you have this sort of equilibrium that's reached and the population doesn't grow or decline too much in an ideal setting. Uh, the idea behind maximum sustainable yield is that you actually cull your deer population to say half of what the carrying capacity is, and that allows a lot more resources for improved productivity by the animals left behind. So you have a lot higher fawning rates. The idea is that you have increased fawning rates and fawn survival because there are far more, there's more space on the landscape and less competition between deer. Um, I, I would imagine there's some historic, there's historic debate about, I think, maybe the accuracy of that, or maybe how close you want the to be wisdom of that. But I'm curious if you had any any thoughts on that sort of model of sort of having your of reducing your carrying your herd below carrying capacity to enhance uh, growth rates, and then you can increase harvest because you have every deer is having multiple deer. You have increased twinning, so you can actually harvest more as a result of this sort of increased bonding rates. Yeah, when I'm looking at establishing like a, a doe quota or um, figuring out, you know, how many mouse we have to take off that landscape to get it to where I, I want it to be. I'm walking around and first and foremost doing a, a camera survey. Um, people have a reluctance. A lot of people have a reluctance to do these camera surveys because they seem so foreign. You know, how could you possibly identify how many deer are on the landscape? You can't tell individual does apart. Look into it. I, I, I tell anybody if you can get away with it, if it's legal in your state, do a camera survey, try to get some hard numbers, try to get that data. Um, and then just be observant when you're out and you're walking around, you know. Um, if you're not seeing any green briar or every single um, green briar you see is like eating off to the ground or your jewel weeds having a hard time just establishing or you don't see any oak regeneration or you have a browse line, perfect browse line at five feet going back in your woodlot, there's a lot of signs there telling you that you have too many deer on the landscape. You know, I have a client in um, Pennsylvania and 
their first two years under my management, I had them, it was 800 acre property and I had them shoot, it was 43 does the first year. And I think they got 39 last year. And they killed the biggest buck they've ever killed on the property last year, <laughs> you know, but it was because they had this reluctance. They had so many mouths to feed out there during the rut. There was, there was does ready to breed everywhere. Those bucks didn't have to travel too far to find a doe that was susceptible at the time. So they're hunting, you know, they have all those deer out there, but they're never exposing themselves because they never needed to. Um, you can have a, a, a ton of deer on the landscape, but it, it's not always going to translate to better hunting success. And so that's kind of the message I'm always trying to push to people is like, if you get up to carrying capacity, you're right on the verge of a catastrophe. You know, if you have, you know, EHD move in or blue tongue or whatever, you're, you're so close. To, everything's in such close proximity. Look at like what happened with COVID in the major cities where everything gets out of hand real fast. If you can keep everything on the lower end, you know, try to keep at that suburban level where you don't have everyone shoulder to shovel, shoulder to shoulder on your on your property. It, it, a, it cuts down on that stress that I was talking about over and over and over again, that social stress. Um, it cuts down on the nutritional stress that they're going to encounter because there's there's less mouse on the landscape. So again, at the end of the day, all this stuff kind of bleeds into that underlying theme of minimizing stress on these animals. Yeah, cool. And I've seen also some, some people who have talked about when you have thinner doe populations, the bucks start competing more you have a greater ratio of bucks. Stuff. You start seeing these behaviors that you didn't see before where they're, they're sparring more, they're grunting you can more. rattle them in. Yeah, it's cool. Well-managed yeah. herds fun to play with. <laughs> yeah, cool. Um, okay, great. So next up, we're making good progress through this. Um, somebody, you got an unsolicited plug from Sean. Thanks, Sean. Bites. Bites, is that is how he pronounces it? He says he yeah. highly recommends your services. Uh, really appreciated your help. So that was a nice... Nice Thank testimonial you. there for you. Uh, Taylor Quinn, and this is for everybody and myself, picture this, she said, is the, uh, he or she said, is the most accurate app um, they've used and additional features make it worth, make it $30 a year. And she uh, says that it's worth it for, and they use it daily. So I might have to check out, picture this myself. So uh, Matthew says, thanks. And finally, Terry Tabler, our last question coming in here. And thanks everybody for staying a few minutes later. And thank you, Zach, for staying over at one uh asked uh, what do you recommend to plant by seed after eliminating stilt grass from shaded wooded areas versus a sunny meadow also we have a pokeweed explosion given it's a native and deer do browse on younger plants should i resist the urge to cull it i love pokeweed <laughs> i say that and then like all my clients in pennsylvania can't stand it <laughs> but um, I, I don't know. It's a beautiful plant. I like having it around. So as far as natives to plant after the um, stilt grass elimination, I don't know if you have to plant anything originally. Like my thought would be when trying to eliminate the stilt grass problem, I would let it go for a couple of years and just keep coming back to treat it. Because as soon as you go and plant something in there, it's going to be much harder to keep track of if it's starting to emerge again. Um, so just see what's going to be there in, in the, if, if it's on a logging road or something and you think you can get away with planting some clover, you know, if you can plant a broadleaf, um, something durable, like a clover, get that in there. Um, then you can still treat with, uh, grass selective herbicides. Uh, so you can go that approach. The only issue I, I, I take with that is if like, again, this is me coming at it as a hunter and not so much as a conservationist. If I'm doing it on those logging roads or wood roads or wooded areas, if I plan on accessing a hunting stand or a tree stand or something along that wood road, um, I'm not going to plant it in clover. I don't want those deer to be out there munching on clover when I'm trying to get to my standing hunt. So um, that's just immediately that's where my, my mind would go. Clover's cheap. It's easy to establish. Um, and it's a broadleaf. So it'd give you some freedom as far as treating that. That's still grass. Awesome. Awesome. I have a few questions uh, myself, but um, maybe I will drop in one easy one for you and, and hear your thoughts on it. But you mentioned a few times uh, tracking individual bucks and aging them. First off, how do you know this is the same buck? Um, you know, year to year, do you sometimes have ambiguity on that? Mm -hmm. High top looked like a pretty unique, unique deer uh, that you showed. Uh, but then how do you, what's your way that you age them? So aging deer on the hoof is something you can tell, like I got a poster behind me. Um, Ryan Kirby, very tremendous artist. Um, this one, it kind of depicts going yearling, one or 
fawn healing one after i don't know um that's a great poster if anybody wants it check him out on his website uh but when i'm looking at a deer like i said that four and a half year old is is kind of the benchmark i'm going on and if you're looking at a deer depending on the time of year that body the body size is going to be a little different they might have a little more fat on them they might have a bigger belly you know they might be bigger neck on them but when i'm thinking about a four and a half year old deer i always think if that deer is standing broadside in front of you and you take a, a two by four or a heavy duty pole and you put it right across its midsection and lift up on that animal right underneath it you know a three and a half year old deer is gonna fall on his back uh, or i gotta get i gotta get my thoughts right yeah so three and a half year old deer if you pick up on that thing it's gonna fall on its on its hind end it's heavier in the back if you pick up on that thing in the midsection a four and a half year old deer he's just as full in his front quarters as he's in the back people talk about having like a rectangle shape that's four and a half year old deer. He'd be pretty level if you picked up on that two by four across his midsection. Five and a half year old deer, if you did the same exercise, he's gonna fall on his face. He's so front heavy with all the extra mass up there in his chest. So that's one way I look at it. I'm looking at, at the brisket. I'm looking at what's going on in front, um, just overall body. Like if I could just see a silhouette of the deer broadside, you can get pretty accurate as far as aging them. You don't have to know a ton of detail um to be able to get whether or not it's four and a half or even if you just want to diagnose it as shooter or non-shooter you know wherever that benchmark may be but that's kind of in my head that that's the little little game that i play when a deer walks out as far as being able to determine a deer being the same deer from one year to the next year i'm looking at a couple things i'm looking at historical use where have i seen that deer in the past i'm looking at his his antler configurations you know how does that main beam lay out does he do his tines come in towards the top of his head? Are they parallel? Do they angle forward? They're going to keep characteristics like that similar year to year. Now, granted, if they get an injury, it might affect their antler. It might affect the opposite antler. Stuff like that does happen. But for the most part, once they get to about two and a half, three and a half years, like once you get in that range, they'll have enough characteristics on them where you should be able to keep up with them. Now, like last year, I had a couple eight pointers run around on my property that were Beautiful. I think I put a picture of one of them standing out in those soybeans. I got a 10 pointer run around this year that I, I keep trying to turn into one of those eight pointers from last year, but I'm just not 100% certain. <laughs> I'm not going to put my stamp on it that that is that same year, but you can look at other things too. Like Bender had a double throat patch. That was something to look at. If they have any markings on their ear, if they're missing a chunk of their ear or anything like that, like there's other attributes you can look at but for the most part their antler configuration is going to be very similar from year to year cool cool art smith uh commented to learn some new things especially about removing some of the nanny does as opposed to the two-year-old ones and thanks and i popped yeah, in a yeah, few links to they'll be yeah. less likely to pin you in the tree in the tree stand as well yeah mature does get very smart they are very smart and i've seen them the, yeah i've I've seen amazing things where they can spot me from a hundred yards away in a tree stand, fully camouflaged with a face mask on. And yeah. I've had them look over at me in windy weather when there was background movement and they look over and see me and take off, uh, you know, so they're, she probably they're watching some of them the are trained. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, well, great. Uh, I think everybody enjoyed this. Thank you all for joining and thanks Zach for staying on an extra 12 minutes here. And uh, this will be up on our YouTube channel shortly. And uh, thanks for everybody, and I look forward to seeing you all next month, September 20th, about turtles and learning more about turtles. I can't uh, wait for that one. Yeah. All right, everybody. Uh, thank you very much, and we will see you soon. Thanks for having Take me. Take care. Yeah, thank you. Bye.